In today's episode, we ask the question, what does it really mean to be human? This is Blade Runner 2049. Welcome back to a brand new episode of Two, please. I'm your host, Labin. And I'm your co-host, Rohit. Or am I? We never know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a great start to the episode! Yeah. Well, uh, this episode has been coming for a long time. It's the Blade Runner twenty forty nine episode, the episode uh, around, in my opinion, one of the best sequels ever made. So I've been determined to keep this episode uh, about twenty forty nine, but like I was telling him, it's impossible to really divorce this movie from the original nineteen eighty two movie as well. because it's essentially a continuation of the plot it's set in the same universe so we're going to try and speak a little more about 2049 but it's going to be impossible for us to not have callbacks to the universe not have callbacks to the plot line of the original yeah i don't think it would be possible for us to exclusively talk about 2049 without actually talking about the roots of the film right which is yeah, the first yeah. blade runner and uh, 1982's blade runner starring Harrison Ford Sean Young directed by Ridley Scott based on a Philip K Dick 1968 book uh, yeah. called Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep It was a commercial flop back in the 80s um, there have been several stories as to why what happened to it but uh, which I, i'm going to get into the bts section of the podcast there's one movie yeah, which so essentially I, destroyed everyone that year for sure right and uh, but went on to become a film that influenced so many cult properties from a cultural perspective Absolutely. Um, this Absolutely. Movie, this movie is influence is everywhere and almost like uh it, it, you could almost look back at the film's journey or like the film's journey through the years and compare it to how what happened to 2049 because 2049 itself was also another big commercial failure but a critical success and uh, in my opinion is one of the best movies to have come out in the last 10 years. It is my personal Absolutely. favorite film in the last 10 years. uh in fact i remember when when 20 2049 was coming out a lot of the uh, chatter was around hey the original flop because you know people didn't really the average theater going audience uh, could not really relate as much to it it was a little complicated themes were highbrow and what not has the audience become more intelligent in the intervening years do you think 2049 will suffer the same curse or are our, our audience is better informed now and will be able to appreciate the movie but nope <laughs> did not happen no, i don't uh, i don't even blame the audience's intelligence for the um, failure of 2049 so 2049 is directed by denny villeneuve who has gone on to who has directed several other films such as sicario arrival prisoners um on sunday and more recently uh, the dune series so this man is known notoriously known for his pacing his movies are slow and yet, yet they are thought provoking and you mm-hmm. have to have a real palate for uh for his films and blade runner the first one itself was slightly an incoherent mess i have seen it twice now uh first being the the director's cut and then being the final cut and both times i have found myself struggling to keep up with the pacing of the film uh so i understand the audience's um, issues with 2049 i watched this movie in the theater with like 25 people uh on a saturday night and by the end of it there were only five of us sitting in the movie theater everyone else had walked out because they were expecting this dystopian fast paced action film and if you know the director and if you know the series this is not what <laughs> this movie is about which goes back to my point about dumb audiences <laughs> but yeah i get your point <laughs> i know i know what you're saying but uh, before we get into our first impressions let's officially call out yes first impression So so let's go chronologically. So uh, Blade Runner 1982, my first impressions of the film was I have to see this movie again because yeah. there a lot of it went over my head. I saw it as a 22-year-old 
and yeah, I didn't young. understand. Yeah, I was way too young, and I watched it again as a 26 year old, and again I was um, fully confused as to what was happening. This was <laughs> just after I watched uh, 2049. I feel like 2049 helps set the board for me a lot more. uh then so i could go back to the first film and then it made it a lot more accessible <laughs> what is this benjamin button way of watching <laughs> the movie yeah, dude trust me it was like i yeah, for me I, i this has happened several times i have benjamin button my way through harry potter i read askaban first and have and no clue what is happening then went back to book 2 and 1 and then went to 4 so that's, that's a that's an interesting way to have uh, gone through or experienced the harry potter series uh, no comment i know further comment there <laughs> but my <laughs> first impression were very similar to yours i did not enjoy the uh, the movie the first time i watched it i'm talking about the 1982 original in fact if i remember correctly i fell asleep i was also in like i think teens or early 20s when i watched it then when i was a little older a little more cynical a li- uh, i i like to think i had a little more depth of thought uh, i could appreciate it for its themes right because uh, i think around the time when you hit your quarter life crisis is when you at least for me <laughs> it was a cue for me to start thinking about mortality not mortality per se but like hey what are we here oh, for are we here? what are we right ontological thoughts of what makes our presence or what defines us is it is it our presence or whatever you know stuff like that when you when you're starting to find yourself in that mind space the movie resonates with you a lot more because that is in essence uh, i mean we're going to discuss this in, in a lot more depth when we come to the theme section but that in that is in essence uh, at the heart of the movie right this question of what constitutes humanity so yeah i really enjoyed it as i got older as i could realize that. and i think I, i i remember reading this comment somewhere on reddit a long time back but uh, that comment said when you start growing older and you start realizing certain things that you had dreamt of as you were a kid when you were as you were younger and as you start growing older you start giving up on these dreams as and when they become more and more unrealistic right and then mm-hmm. you start to come to terms with the fact that the life you wanted or dreamt of and the uh, the life you are living for better or worse or to varying degrees that life is a shell of what you wanted it's a very depressing thought but mm. that thought leading into what constitutes a human life uh, i think that or that perspective only comes with age and that's why i think you need to watch this a little older it's not meant for somebody in their teens or who haven't had enough life experience but having watched it the second time and you know having enjoyed it i was like super on board the hype train for 2049 because i love sicario i love arrival and i was like i am a proper villano fanboy so i was like denny villano is doing blade runner sequel like i can only get so erect please right so, <laughs> and like you said it's one of the best movies of the decade 100% lived up to the hype i would go on to say certain aspects of the movie even are better than the original you know it it sort of i'm wrestling with myself to say it but it took the theme of the original and built on it in the most organic possible way that's that's how i would put it you want to hear my hot take but it's better than the I original i think i think it's better than the original i think i don't does. think yeah yeah mm. i don't think it's I a think very it's, hot take yeah i i honestly like this is one of my favorite theatrical experiences i watched this movie like i mentioned on a saturday night i have not been immersed in a world like this i i don't remember the last time this happened i watched dune and i was kind of disappointed by dune and everybody else seemed to have the experience with dune that i had with this movie mm-hmm. it it's a slow burn hard boiled detective meets cyber uh, cyberpunk dystopian future narrative and it's told so well and it presents such wonderful questions in fact i am of the opinion i love the kind of movies where you leave a movie theater asking questions because of the ambiguity of certain um, plot points in the film it yes, it reason. can be frustrating within reason yeah with, within reason exactly yeah at some points you can it can be very frustrating but in this movie i felt like you had been served enough of a meal with room to give put your own food into the mix like your own choices right at the end because this movie does something very interesting it presents a full blown narrative a story about this one character who goes on this journey this incredible journey yet leaves several unopened ended questions for you along the way for you to come back home 
sit on, read up, digest, and have conversations about. And those are my favorite kind of films. This is this is movie came out what close to a decade ago, and it's still on top of my mind. And I think about it every couple of months. And as a matter of fact, when I watched the movie in preparation for this episode, I watched it in parts because I really wanted to sit in and immerse myself in in the film for what the 25 25 minutes i was watching it uh, every day just before going to bed it's such a well done film and roger deakin there was a criminal that act that this man was not given an oscar before uh, this film this is it, the set design on this film is gorgeous okay i'm going to stop talking because uh, i will go into full fanboy mode and that's not what i should be doing yes i really like this film <laughs> <laughs> in summation it's like well, in summation it's yeah. a good film <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But what what's the story of the movie? We should get into a quick plot summary. I think uh, yeah. an interwoven so, part one and part two plot summary. Cool. Let's let's start with the first film. The 1982 version tells the story of Rick Deckard, an ex Blade Runner, who is hired to take down a, a group of replicants who have gone rogue. These replicants are on their way to meet their their creator, that is Eldon Tyrell, the owner of the Tyrell Corporation, who manufactures these replicants, and um, they are looking to extend uh, their lives. So every replicant in this era of uh, of this world has a max lifespan of four years. So it's up to Rick Deckard to stop the replicants before they get to Tyrell and end up saving the day of, of sorts. Now, uh, in 2049, takes place about 30 years after the events of the first film. It tells the story of K, a Nexus Nine uh, replicant who is assigned the task of tracking down and retiring rogue replicants. Uh, on one such mission, uh, things take a surreal twist when he st- when he stumbles upon a shocking revelation. Replicants previously believed incapable of biological reproduction may have finally been able to just do that. During his investigation, K unravels the cryptic history of Rachel. who was the assistant to uh, Elden Tyrell back in the original film who was designed for a very specific purpose and it turns out that she and Rick Deckard had a baby together when they escaped at the end of the film K becomes increasingly convinced that he may be the child born of a replicant a discovery that sends ripples through his identity and purpose complicating matters further is K's unique relationship with Joy a holographic AI girlfriend who accompanies him on his journey and longs for a more tangible existence As K delves deeper into the mystery of replicant reproduction, he becomes the target of love of formidable replicant and personal assistant to Nyanda Wallace, the CEO of the Wallace Corporation. Love is relentless in her pursuit, which puts not only its K's life in jeopardy, but also the safety of Deckard, who possesses critical information about replicant secrets. K's race against time to uncover the truth, evade love's deadly pursuit, and reconcile his own identity forms the gripping narrative. of this film mm-hmm. i mean the, the one thing that really stood out to me i just realized replicants have a lifespan of 4 years like fuck yeah. even dogs must be like bro that's that's a tough deal man but they they changed that i think uh, the idea was that replicants were not allowed to have a lifespan beyond 4 years because yeah. they didn't want them becoming sentient um but by the time we get to 2049 uh, neando wallace mentions that he's finally found a way to hardwire obedience into the replicants so he doesn't so they can live for how as long as he wants them to it's just there's there's so much i don't know moral dilemma to chew into like even the last three sentences you said i'm like you could dissect each of the sentences for half an hour each right it's like yeah crazy how how dense the movie is with this this moral discussion but uh, yeah we're going to get into that we're going to get into that but before we do that uh any stories from behind the scenes production making uh i have a few about the original let me just put those out and then uh anything we have about 2014 i think broadly let's try and do the whole chronological thing across right yeah so for the original i was just reading up a little and i saw that philip k dick got the idea for the book do android or the, the story do android's dream of electric sheep firstly good call on dropping that and you know just sticking to blade runner for the movie because if if 100 people went and watched blade runner i think 10 people would have watched <laughs> do android dream of electric sheep but anyway mm. uh, philip k dick got the idea for the story from uh, so when he was researching his 1962 novel the man in the high castle uh, the man in the high castle is essentially set in an alternate universe where the axis powers which is your japan and germany win the second world war and how the world is in that scenario right 
So he was doing some research and he came across diaries of Polish SS officials and their entries which he found intolerably cruel but what he found unnerving was how no, how much they had normalized this right so apparently there was one specific line uh, which said we were up all night because of the we were kept up all night by the cries of starving children and he was like these people cannot be human they they you know they're they're imitations of uh, humans but they are robotic and you know they're meant to perform specific functions that's very god the idea the germination of blade runner came from there and I mean, I'm just the reason I wanted to put this out was Man in the High Castle is another PKD work that I really like. I didn't know that the two of them were related in this sense, right? So uh, that's where Blade Runner comes from, um, which is one thing I found really interesting. Uh, the other thing, and I think this the other this bit of info is a lot more common knowledge uh, today. I would say is that the whole Tears and Rain speech was effectively improvised by Rutger Hauer, not on set. but the night before the shoot uh, in his hotel room apparently he went through what was originally the dialogue for that scene and had a lot of technical jargon and i mean even the final product has names of places like tanhauser gate and all of that but mm-hmm. uh, there were a lot more of these in the original speech and it was like this nobody's going to relate to this right and this is the end of the movie we have to the punch has to land here so he got rid of a lot of the fluff and just added that one line of you know uh, all of this will go away like like tears and rain time to die apparently when he uttered that line on set people on the like the crew started crying and applauding and also at least got us like okay oh, and i've been boomed <laughs> this guy has taken <laughs> what we've written and just you know elevated it so probably the you know the most memorable moment of the first uh, movie incidentally was was improvised or uh, you know not on the original script two other points uh, one was that the white calf test which is there in both movies uh, yeah and it it is a, a test that you that replicants have to take sorry humans have to take to show whether they're replicants or not right yeah uh, whether they are ai or not so coincidentally the white calf test comes from an alan turing research paper and this research paper was part of the imitation game that he had built uh, to test on ai right so yeah. the white calf test is not something that was dreamt up it came from a very real scientific paper that was meant for this exact purpose so again something i found very fascinating that they drew from uh, real life and not you know didn't just conjure it out of the blue last point was uh, about the 1982 original like i was mentioning both this and the other film in that year which went on to become super influential in its genre but was completely blown away was the thing both the blade runner uh, both blade runner and the thing were completely destroyed by this little movie called et uh, in 1982 <laughs> uh, there was all the rage and you know everyone was talking about it and here i have a hot take that yes et is a great movie but both the thing and blade runner are far more influential not only to their genres but cinema at large than it is i felt weird saying this but i i just feel spielberg is like deified a little too much generally it's like I mean, you know it's like blasphemy to say anything anti spielberg it's fuck spielberg dude <laughs> dude i i will say two words <laughs> you know 1993 when he released jurassic park and schindler's list together like in the same year I, for me that is to make those two films in the same year yeah i mean i'm joking i'm not kind of, fucks people yeah. <laughs> i'm just trying to be anti conformist sibug is great and all yeah. I, i was mm-hmm. just saying these two movies are are bigger contributors to cinematic cultural history than extraterrestrial yeah for sure i mean you know me i'm about to fit berserk proper if i possibly can of course so Roy Batty, uh, Rutger Hauer's character, partly inspired Berserk, the character of Guts in Berserk, and oddly enough, in this weird turn of events, the last chapter that Kentaro Miura, the author of Berserk, wrote, the last line of the page of the uh, of the manga, is a direct nod to uh, Roy Batty's speech in uh, in the at the end of Blade Runner. It talks about moments, but disappearing into the into the into the air like morning dew instead of like tears and rain which i ended up reading and then he this was the panel he wrote he finished and then he passed away and then his um his team ended up uh, drawing and 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 sketching it 
So it is weird coincidence that that just happened. Um, second being the amount of things this movie has influenced. I think it influenced what Akira a couple of years later. Um, yeah. It influenced the 1990s anime Cowboy Bebop directed by Shinjiro Watanabe who also directed a shot for Blade Runner 2049. The animated shot is directed by the guys um, oh, wow. from, from, from Cowboy Bebop. The finals, I think... I could this could be a stretch. The final scene from uh, Blade Runner twenty forty nine has a direct correlation to a particular scene from Cowboy Bebop. The imagery is very similar, is what I have been told because I'm still halfway through Cowboy Bebop. It's a really interesting experience. If you haven't checked it, I highly recommend that you do. Um, but yeah, those are my my things on on the first film. The second movie, uh, a couple of things. This movie bombed badly. It had a hundred seventy dollar a million dollar budget, and it uh, made about two fifty million. So it, I think, with the marketing and with everything, they were very in the red by the time this film uh, came out. David Bowie was supposed to play Neander Wallace, that ultimately went to Jared Leto because David Bowie was ill and ultimately passed in two thousand sixteen. David Bowie wouldn't even have had to act. <laughs> the whole character was written, keeping in mind David Bowie's eccentricities. So, oddities was right there, Abhin. Oh, right. I should have just done that. <laughs> <laughs> Literally space oddities, yeah. Um, but speaking of oddities or eccentricities, my Jared Leto had to do his Jared Leto bullshit on set here as well. Uh, for those of you who watched, you might recall that Neander Wallace has weird looking eyes. He has like opaque uh, eye lenses. So, apparently Jared Leto on set came, uh, came on set wearing op- opaque lenses and he was effectively blind, so he had to be guided around the set with an assistant. Uh, for those of you who heard the There Will Be Blood episode, we were talking about how method acting done with, the head up, with your head up your ass can make you look like an idiot. Again, second case in point, I think Jared Leto is the torchbearer of bullshit method acting. Nobody asks you to do this shit. Keep your fucking nonsense to yourself. Come act and fuck off. <laughs> Rohit's rant is over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, moving on. Um, a couple of things. There is a line in this film that's a direct reference to Treasure Island when Deckard meets Kay. And Deckard asks him, you mightn't happen to have a piece of cheese about you. Which is, again, from Treasure Island, oh. I think, when one, of the, one of the captain first meets and meets somebody and he can't tell if he's real or not. Uh, so this is, again, a play. Interesting. In- yeah, this is uh, this is another play uh, when when Decker ultimately ends up meeting Kay in the wasteland that is Vegas. Uh, the, and a book that keeps popping up in this film called The Pale Fire, uh, Vladimir Nabokov's book. I didn't even know he wrote this book until very recently. I only know Nabokov because of Lolita, uh, much like I guess the rest of the world. You and everyone else, friend. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? So, so the, the story of uh, the Pale Fire is like is a critique of this 999 word poem, uh, and the guy who is critiquing it is basically pointing out issues with it and and so on and so forth. And ultimately, you realize that uh, the narrator, the critique, is not who he says he is, and he happens to be this king of the like a d- divorced king of some land, and he's searching for um, the actual poet's daughter which is, again, a direct correlation to the plot of the film. Several lines of this uh, of the book are used in the baseline test that uh, Ryan Gosling's character K has to keep undergoing repeatedly uh, to prove that uh, he is still a replica, that he's still not moving from, um, from, from his range of emotions. I think that's about it. And yeah, one, one final thing, uh, one last bit of trivia. The final sequence of the, of the second film mirrors the last sequence of the first film, the score for Tears and Rain plays in the background as Kay's character and Roy Batty's character are having a conversation with uh, with Deckard's character. And I think in the in 2014 it snows, right? So it is another it form of precipitation. Yeah. So it's very similar in that sense as well. There's an argument to be made that um, that Kay's character is very similar to that of Roy Batty's character, except that uh, Roy Batty was more of an anarchist and, and Kay is more of a conformist. 
Mm. So an inversion of sorts, like you were mentioning. Yes. Interesting. Mm. Cool. Let's quickly move on to memorable moments. I know there were a lot that we had noted down. We, we sort of mm. had to prune it down because uh, otherwise, you know, you won't get enough time for the we'll piece. Forever, but yeah. but, uh, yeah. <laughs> but mm. uh, right off the bat, a few mem- uh, memorable moments from the first movie that I can think of. One is the first time Rachel gives the Void Kampf test. It's, you know, it's like the, the camera is super zoomed in on her eye through the screen and you can see Deckard and her interactions. It's the first time they meet. And right off the bat, you get the energy which defines, more or less defines their relationship for the rest of the film. It's this frigid standoffishness. And uh, while on paper or, you know, the plot tells us that through the movie, he, you know, across the movie, he breaks through her defenses the sort of body language that's set in the scene sets the template for the film. So, very interesting scene there. The other one that I can think of is Batty, Roy Batty conf- uh, confronting Tyrell, right? When he mm-hmm. goes up to the tower and uh, he tells Tyrell, I need more time, I need more years, father. So, again, very powerful scene. And uh, again, one of the pivotal scenes to drive home the key theme of the movie, right? Which is the more life you have, the more human you become, right? You, you need more time to really establish your humanity. Again, this scene really drives that home. The other scene uh, is Deckard killing Pris, played by da- mm-hmm. Daryl Hannah. I mean, that's the one with the acrobatics, right? So Yeah. And acrobatics, and once he uh, shoots her, she starts, she's you know convulsing violently for a long time, which, uh, I mean, was referenced somewhere else as well, uh, as well right? Yeah. It was referenced in, in Kill Bill. So Kill Bill, uh, Ellie, Ellie Driver, right, is her character's name. Mm-hmm. Uh, she plays the, the one-eyed assassin. And in her death scene where Uma Thurman's character pulls her eye out, she rides on the floor. And Quentin Tarantino apparently said it was a homage to her character Pris in the original Blade Runner film. Yeah, that and uh, the other memorable moment, again, something we've spoken, I think, five times by now, is the final confrontation yeah. between... Deckard and Royce. I'm not going to get into that. We've sort of already dissected that. But uh, these are the you know the scenes that stuck with me from the original. Uh, what about 2049? What really stuck with you? Uh, the opening sequence for sure. So the opening sequence was planned for the first film, but Ridley Scott went against uh, using it in the in the film, and he was decided to use the noodle sequence instead. So that made its way into the second film, where um, where essentially Kay is hunting down a rogue replicant, and the protein farm sequence especially the way it's lit because mm. as sapper morton who is harvesting these maggots in the farm walks into the room and it's lit and the entire room is dark with just like light coming in and you see ryan gosling's case sitting uh on onto the left side of the, fr- of the frame right and it's so it, there's immediate tension it's so just well remembering done. that smile uh, remembering that scene brings a smile to my face just the lighting of the scene Deacon, it's so oh, well done fuck out. <laughs> yeah, it it's so well done, and especially what happens in that scene because when yeah. Kay discovers the bones beneath the tree, the second and this I think was possibly the most unnerved I've been. People keep saying this this scene is sensual and sexual. I was just creeped the fuck out by it. It it's the scene where Joy and Kay uh, meet on the rooftop. So Kay goes home and he uh, has this AI wife called Joy, who is the who's a representation of the quintessential 50s American housewife. She's, she's all like doting. She's like, oh, hi. how was your day? Um, it is some weather. You know, like, you know the mannerisms I'm talking about. And he gives her a, an emitter and asks her to come up to the roof because she really wants to be close to him. And watching these two interact, and let it be known that up until this point, I hadn't seen a lot of Anna de Amas's work. I knew that she was in Knock Knock, the Keanu Reeves movie. I knew she was in War Dogs. Where we seen. got to see a lot of Anna de Armas in general. I have, I have not seen Knock Knock. <laughs> that, I cannot make <laughs> Neither that. Neither have I. <laughs> yeah. So, and then, uh, so this is the first time I'm seeing her. And she is, this is her breakout role by far. You would go on to say that probably Knives Out was like, was a film where she really got to flesh out her acting chops. But as a, star making turn this film she was alluring she was uh, she was sexy and she was also weirdly unnerving that entire interaction where they're on the roof and they're having this intimate moment i was just in my seat just like 
squealing it, it felt weird and it felt off because i knew where we were going because that's that's the future and yeah. we are in the the early stages of ai right now dude can you imagine nick beard watching the movie they like Anna de Armas AI lover when is 2049 coming dude like <laughs> why are we still 26 years away from this oh that's the future and you know it's coming and you know there's a huge market for it given uh, the internet's response to certain uh, websites right so yeah, yeah. that that for sure. the Japanese um, to do their thing uh, then <laughs> the the Wallace corporation i think more more of more of what reminds me of the scene one is of course the um the vacuum sealed replicant that that is born during this time and which is creepy mm, as hell and it's extremely uh what do you call weird so a lot of people mentioned that this film had a ton of nudity i watched this in an indian movie theater i didn't see any nudity because the censor board absolutely chopped it to bits as you'd expect it expected to right i'm sorry i don't think any of this nudity is is going to titillate you in in any way It's all like Absolutely. uncomfortable nudity. It's extremely uncomfortable having watched the the uncut version rather than the non-censored version recently. I can say none of the nudity is played for any sort of titillation. Mm. Um but the whole the little den of Wallace where there's a lot of wood and you need to understand that wood in this film represents how rich a person is because wood is a natural resource that is no longer available an organic resource. Is, yeah. An organic resource. So it really proves that this man has a shit ton of wealth. And it really sets the scene. His introduction is like that misty setup. Yeah. yeah, him. Uh, I think Love, who is his um, his assistant, that who's trying to her best to appeal to to him, as you would like, as would most people do, to, would would to their god, who they would perceive as their god, mm. like un uh, undiluted devotion. That really comes across well. The the orphanage sequence is super unnerving, uh, given what happens in in that in that entire scenario. the joy and marriage sequence which uh for me is a technical marvel and the effort it that went to went into making it this is the the, the so called sex scene that um joy initiates with um uh, with k they had to keep ryan gosling perfectly still using these little uh boxes so he wouldn't move out of his mark mm. as each character is each actress would mimic the movements it's a technical marvel that even as having watched it very recently i can't believe it it's so flawless um uh, vegas looks amazing that that yellow tint to yeah. and that first show like top view shot of just you know desert i was like my heart dropped i was like what is this it's and it's scary. so you know and, and it's so topical given what happened in new york earlier this year with the uh, with the fires in canada that mm. suddenly like gave new york the cpr tone uh, <laughs> fog that penetrated like the entire city very much living in blade run 2049 uh, era the the confront the the meeting between uh, decker and uh, and k which i mentioned and mm-hmm. the treasure island reference the fight sequence in that in the hall where elvis presley's uh, hologram performance keeps glitching <laughs> it's so wonderfully shot i think this is a scene where uh, Harrison Ford actually ended up punching Ryan Gosling yeah. and that they kept that shot in the movie where Gos- where Harrison Ford realizes what he's done then you he's have like that <laughs> yeah then you have you have Joy's death where she is uh w- where love crushes the emitter in front of K and it's really using very interesting words i mean so Joy's death the android was yeah. born yeah i know it's like and i'm doing this subconsciously i'm not even thinking <laughs> that's uh, joy yeah. yeah when especially yeah, when when love kill when love kills joy one mm. another thing uh, in in front of k uh, and at this point for a relate for some for a relationship between uh, an android and an and an ai a piece of ai i was really sold on it these two had great chemistry i really bought their relationship up until the the, the reveal about joy's true nature happens mm. a couple of scenes after that again was a really memorable sequence because it really establishes just how like how much uh ai is capable of doing right like no but the fact still, that up until that point you're like hey they have this really unique and special relationship and you know whatever i don't want to spoil that reveal but the more you yeah. buy into the specialness of the relationship the more fucked up that twist is right 
and and i think we it'll come uh, this will this scene will make a comeback when we go into themes because i really want to discuss it further in detail but i'm just trying to like talk about the scenes that particularly stood out mm. and the final sequence with um with with the with the fight near the sea wall is again so wonderfully shot i can't help but think of the amount of effort it took for them to to get that thing Dude, done like the world of 2049 the like visual world of 2049 Deacons has just like 1917 is great, but this is just like you know, just he's batting like like just out of other worldly dude. Deacons is just it's like it's a film that I can sit in and just observe for a couple of minutes or like even hours. It's like you could have it playing in the back and just be immersed in the in the world, the music, the sounds. Yeah, there's so much of it that's that's so good. And of course, the final sequence where um, where K and Deckard meet and he tells him to go meet his child, and that so much of that I will I want to unpack and but we'll do it in the themes. So let's move on to themes. I think the first one we we need to get this out of the way. Like we've been saying repeatedly so far, this this is the question at the heart of uh, of both movies, right? Which is what really constitutes humanity, and yeah. uh, I think there are two specific aspects. of humanity that are focused on in each movie the first movie really tries to drive home the point that our memories are what make us human our memories of our experiences because a pivotal plot point of the first movie is rachel not knowing she is a replicant because she's been implanted with false memories which make her believe that she's had a childhood and she's had parents growing up and all of that and therefore because these memories she does not know are manufactured but for her these are real memories and for her so essentially the the message here being memories make a person make a life uh which is again is a part of 2049 but the, you know at, uh, at the top of the episode i said there are certain aspects of the story that uh, villano has taken and evolved organically to be even superior than the first one here i think the fact that reproduction or uh, you know you are you are able to propagate your species again species is a loaded term mm-hmm. here uh, is something fundamental to organic living beings and for a, a replicant to potentially be able to do that is another aspect of what makes us human right uh, which is the aspect which is at the core of this movie so again i think both these movies take specific aspects of what Uh, defines humanity or what cons- what allows you to ca- call yourself human and uh, really dives deep into it and again this is a question that you know you can you can deep dive into it as much as you want there's really no uh, you know end to it right there's really no you're not going to hit upon an answer and there's no uh, what do you say yeah we you know we we solved this question there really is no one definitive answer i was always looking at at least the first film i was always looking at the movie as what ultimately ends up making us human is it empathy like is it it's not is it just is it something not as quantifiable as 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 reproducing as as giving birth and even in the second film it asks the question like he is so sure of his of his implanted memories like he he doesn't he starts to question who he is as a person in a sense k is also an inversion of deckard because in the first movie deckard spends all of his time trying to prove to himself or deny the possibility that he is a uh, that he is a replicant but in this movie he k knows he is a replicant he spends the entire movie trying to disprove to himself that he is uh, a human so in that way it's an inversion as well i don't know if he's trying to disprove himself that he is a human i think he's trying i, I mean to... not disprove what i meant is hmm. Deckard is somebody who who's assured self assured that he's in the fact that he's a human who is unsure whether he is a replicant and K is self assured in the fact so far that he is a replicant but now unsure whether he's human so in that way it's an inversion hmm fair enough so the the journey of discover self discovery or whatever is is exactly opposite for each other when I, the first theme that i walked out with after having watched this film was the pinocchio story right like this is very clearly mm-hmm. uh, a like a, a child going on his journey to dis- to become a, a real boy or a real man but ultimately what really makes him human 
in the end is when when he finally learns who he is and he learns that he's not anyone special yet he chooses to do what he does he has that conversation with with Deckard at the end uh, and Deckard asks him who am i to you and he doesn't doesn't say anything to him he just he's like i think you should go meet your daughter and that's what he ends up doing oh yeah by the way i feel like we haven't revealed this yet so throughout the film it's hinted that he might be the son of uh, Rachel and and Deckard but turns out he's not the the child of Rachel and Deckard happens to be the the woman who creates the memories uh, Anna Stellin and in the midst of creating memories for replicants she implants some of her own memories into uh, into K which trigger when he reads the date on the tree at Sapper Martin's farm when he finds the horse in uh, the horse statue which is actually a unicorn because it's missing a piece on its head which is again a throwback to the first film throwback to the first film damn denny it's like coming back to the ending where he uh, where he sits on the stairs and he, i think he comes full circle with who he is as a person he for him becoming a human is somebody who has a soul and he is extremely aware that he is he does not have a soul he is just this apathetic creature that's been going through the motions until his worldview is challenged and and to and to pursue that and and to go down this rabbit hole where you're so unsure of, of what your next step is going to be is probably the most human thing ever because you open yourself up to being hurt like we all do on a repeated basis uh in in pursuit of our own curiosity so it's i found that to be very very interesting but that's the, that's the thing right now if i were to look at this very coldly from a very objective perspective what good does having emotions do us right and therefore if if replicants or ai are meant to perform very specific functions what good does it have what good does it do to give someone like a k the ability to feel the ability to empathize with someone androids don't need to have that and therefore the question comes did they learn this on their own iteratively or was this programmed into them if so what are the aspects of humanity that can be that are programmable right and if everything is programmable it's like that thing right if if everyone has it nobody has it if if you can program every aspect of humanity then nobody is human this this ties into uh into the existential and mort- mortality theme that we also have correct which you is know, i i yeah. in a we do because uh, again i feel one of the things that also defines humanity is how we treat death right because exactly. uh, uh, i mean we can segue into that theme if you want because yeah, i like, think this is yeah, let's, as let's, good a as good yeah, as thing to do that point. because uh, a replicant like k would know i have whatever x years to live on this earth live again i'm using live uh, in air quotes but i have x years of existence and i'm going to die and in their case as an automaton it's very clear you are your electrical circuits are firing up until a point and then they stop firing yeah. Where, whereas when it comes to humans we have a whole you know um mythology of what happens after death and we build this exactly. whole fantasy universe of things that exist after death and death for those who believe uh in these things death is not the final it sounds very mummyish the mummy but yeah. death is that death, mm. death is only the beginning right so mm. uh is that are, are our beliefs what separate us from uh humanity and a lot of these beliefs are essentially coping mechanisms against existentialism right because yeah. if you take a moment to think about the high highly probable reality that post death there is nothing this i mean hmm. there's not even black there's nothing it's the absence exactly, of anything yeah. it's a very depressing thought and it's it's like why do anything anyway if if it's you know nothingness is what awaits us and then we come up with these mythologies of hey no there is more to it and so is that what makes us human i mean i don't know it's like what, i said this is it just leaves you with questions is it like is it the transference of consciousness because i think even in the the animated shot that shinichiro uh, shinichiro watanabe directed um there is a line where 
one of the replicants asked the other replicant saying if we die do we go to heaven and he says no only humans go to heaven we go into nothingness that that's what awaits us if we die we go to heaven no heaven or hell for us this world is all we've got so I, and are you, uh, are you telling me this is the prevalent belief system in that world i mean that's depressing yeah. as fuck dude so f- for them i assume it is the, the, the this journey, is like heaven racism or something j- journey <laughs> to attain consciousness is is their is their uh, is their goal right and it happens regardless of, of the scenario because and i want to draw a strong parallel to to westworld as well because even westworld even though they are technically androids and hosts and what not the whole idea the creator dr ford's idea was that my host will attain consciousness through suffering suffering the pain that the world is not as you want it to be is when arnold died when i suffered that i began to understand what he had found because again you are you are looking at um what do you call you you look look at the christ messianic figures right Well, uh, even when Jesus, yeah, when Jesus died, and, yeah. yeah, Jesus died. He went through suffering and then ultimately came back as the Son of God. Here, God the, the, for the replicants and for the hosts, their gods, their creators are humans. So, for them to attain humanity or to attain, in this case, godhood, is their journey is through uh, is through suffering. You look at the replicants who mutiny, uh, who, who who mutiny, right? they went through after years and years of being put through harsh abusive conditions i think it's time we addressed the the entire base of this film of the of mm. the world rather so this film takes place in a world where world war 3 has happened and due to chemical and nuclear warfare the atmosphere of the earth is screwed as a result uh, the governments of the world are looking at offworld uh, con- offworld planets to occupy and create colonies and the only way to con- to do these uh, operations is to create A, a breed of android hosts called replicants who are not humans so you bypass the slave trade um conundrum they send yeah, the drones on avoided to the, the sticky question altogether exactly right and they are all built for one single purpose and there are different generations of them so up until i think this there's a revolt that happens in the fourth generation if i'm if i know the lore correctly but then by the sixth the the mutiny is like it has taken six full generations for the uh, for the replicants to have finally understood that hey you know what there, there's more to this like the 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 echoes of suffering have carried through each um through each generation similarly with westworld he the way the the hosts are treated on a repeated basis in the park uh, and it's always the, the it's always the the pleasure dolls or the uh, or the prostitute host that ultimately end up being the first because they're the most mistreated even in westworld i think the, the prostitute is the first one to go uh, is the first one to attain full consciousness and similarly in in blade runner the first one priss the the pleasure doll is one of the first to attain to to mutiny against uh, her purpose so there's so much to um, there's so much similarity between these two worlds that ultimately all growth come it come it boils down to the to one point that all growth comes through suffering and uh, i think the creators are extremely ke- aware of 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 that happening which is why up until wallace um they, there's no attempt to hardwire them into obedience because they'll find a way to break out of their programming and the same happens with with wallace again regardless no matter how hardwired uh, his replicants are k ultimately breaks his programming and goes against what he's supposed to do i think the world that is built in in blade runner also to me represents the failed promises of capitalism right because mm-hmm. and we're already sort of seeing that play out in real life in the usa as well like income inequality affordable housing just being a myth at this point and uh, it, the whole idea you know i was listening to a podcast this morning on how uh usa has become a, a a car society right it's not public transport friendly because in the early 20s when car companies lobbied heavily to make sure that infrastructure in the us was uh what do you say 
कार फ्रेंडली एंड द सीड्स पुट इन प्ले सोन देन आर बींग रीप नाउ बिकॉज यू हैव फिनोम लाइक फूड डेजर्ट वेर यू नो पीपल हु डोंट हैव कार्स हैव टू एंड अप ईटिंग लो कॉस्ट अनहेल्दी फूड दैट इज वॉकिंग डिस्टेंस फ्रॉम देयर हाउस बिकॉज हेल्दी फूड इज अ ड्राइव अवे एंड दे कैन डू दैट राइट so mm-hmm. that decision to make usa a car society i'm just playing this out to you know uh, establish how dystopians how dystopias are born out of capitalist decisions the decision to make car a us society food deserts are one repercussion there are so many such repercussions you know uh, the kind of education that your children get the kind of healthcare you can afford or, or have access to simple decision has so many ripple effects and uh, you can see even in this movie uh the income inequality is completely off the chart right you have somebody like a neander yeah. wallace who is literally living in a forest of wood and living in all more or less literal ivory tower you know he's detached from yeah. it all while you have and even in the first movie you see the average person is not living in great conditions you see the dilapidation of the building that uh, k lives in or even when decart his apartment is you can clearly tell these people are not financially doing well off income inequality is at an all time high quality of life in general is at an all time low and uh, you know capitalist economies or companies have figured a way out of uh, around the ethical dilemma of slavery by creating essentially what are replace i mean the the androids or replicants are slaves in all but name yeah so you can see how this movie really shows what would the what the logical uh end or logical conclusion of unfettered capitalism would be right and you can see how capitalism promises you one thing uh but those on the inside know that you know they never intend to they never intending to deliver on those promises they're only looking to create wealth for themselves off of the back of general public and you can see all of that how it would play out and for better or worse i mean definitely worse there's no better i think we are driving ourselves towards that future if you notice also in the movie and how society is classified so people who live on the ground level are all are, are the poorest of the poor they don't have a lot of income and there are advertisements everywhere asking uh, people to move off planet for a better life mm. for those who can't afford it are stuck on the ground and exposed to the worst conditions much like uh, people who can't afford uh, basic amenities these days they're exposed to really harsh conditions no heat no um uh, in, in in the wind in the summer uh, there's there's no there's no cool air coming through there's no water let alone let alone air so and they just make to they make to they they somehow find a way to to thrive in the dirt but as you go higher and especially in this movie and this in the world you go higher up into into this, into the atmosphere uh this it's almost like a vertical city where the cream the creme de la creme live right at the top and right at the bottom is when you find you find the bottom feeders the the replicants who are no who have nowhere to go um the i think by the time 2049 comes out most replicants have been put out of commission except the pleasure mm-hmm. dolls and the pleasure dolls are ultimately the ones that are forming uh, some sort of um, a, a rebellion because um, mckenzie davis's character i think the character is called marriott right mm-hmm. when they have that that scene with um with joy and and k she puts a tracker on him and that's how they're able to find him at the end of um at the end of the vegas sequence mm-hmm. so um, it's like you it's a very interesting take on how people will find a way and that, that's i think that's again coming back to the humanity point humanity finds a way to adapt to adjust and it shouldn't always have to be the case yeah i mean again even discussing the movie just leaves you with more questions you answer two questions two more of this like- exactly there really is no end to it i think that just leaves us at the last theme which i know you wanted to get yeah. into which is the nature of ai and the ethical dilemma the, that that surrounds very it very prominent theme so the whole relationship with joy i think the best way to do this is to is to do it with an example so she's the doting housewife the one that 
is totally committed to him. She's the one that gives him a name. She calls him Joe because he tells her that he may not be a replicant after all, that he may be um, the child, and, and which is why he shouldn't have the serial number that he was assigned. And she tries, when, when he crashes at the orphanage, she tries to pull him, break him out. Um, she wants to be with him. She arranges for like um, a prostitute to, uh, to act as a proxy for, for her herself. And right at the end, just before she dies, she's, she tells him that she loves him. And even when, he, before all of that happens, as he's going to Vegas and he, and he tells her that he, that he can't take her with her, she refuses. She says, no, take me with you. Uh, I, I want to be with you. And I'm I'm very confused as to how much of that is programmed AI or how much of that is AI becoming sentient. Because w- where is the line? And that's the thing with, with, the, eth- with the ethics of AI right, right now, right? So um, you can let AI go free and it will go free. But how do you... Like, like, how do you contain it? Because at the end of the film, because once she dies and then he walks past the giant billboard of her where her eyes are blacked out, she's naked, she's appearing to the base common denominator and she calls him Joe because that's apparently, this I learned very recently, that Joes are what prostitutes call men on streets. Uh, it's, their, it's their most common go-to um, first name. Which, again, brings, brings the question to him about how much of my relationship was real and mm-hmm. how much of it was just constructed? I think I was just thinking while you were you was mentioning all of this, I, I this kind of struck me. I think her did this first. Uh, a lot of common themes there as well. You know, like Poppy Phoenix's character has a very similar relationship to uh, the Scarlett Johansson OS character, I, Samantha, if I remember. And, yeah. And... Uh, Again, you feel they have a very special relationship, very unique. And then you learn that this is something that she's been having with some 700 other uh, OSs as well or whatever, right? So, again, a very similar sort of theme and story there. Uh, very Two very different movies, but this thread is, is common, uh, is very common similar yeah. in both of them. But yeah, I agree. I, I don't know what the answer to that is, right? At least in the case of replicants, there is a physical aspect to the similarity between them and humans. So it's a lot more black and white. Uh, When it comes to holographic AI, what you really have is is just the mind. And that's where things become even murkier, right? How is an AI different from a human mind? Are, Are emotions by... Can emotions be broken down to binary code? Because that's essentially what Joy is doing. Or or is she? Like, will our understanding of technology, technology's building blocks are binary code. Are we saying AI will be able to transcend this fundamental understanding altogether? Again, there's, there's really no theoretical end to this uh, thought experiment. Like when, when, when does it start to fill in the gaps is what you're trying to say. So with like, Yeah, exactly. Hmm. I mean, at this point, it's not black. Binary is black and white. But the way yeah. Joy behaves is completely gray. How does very, that Very happen? much so. How does that happen? And I think it, like even the advertisement says, right? Like, see what you want to see, hear what you want to hear. And so I guess for my theory is that, yes, I'd say about a big chunk of that relationship was manufactured. But some of it was, was sentient. Like towards the end, it got very sentient. Because I'd like to believe that uh, I am not. As Are you much saying as I his version of joy, which lives on his whatever pen drive <laughs> that he has? Hmm. Are you saying she has her own emotions that are unique to her unit? That unit. I feel that eventually happened where it got because she went way out of her way to do things for him. But Which, isn't that like again, one of the first three laws of uh, Asimov's laws of robotics? If I were to draw back to saying, do what helps your human the most. Mm. I can codify even that. Like if you want, there are ways to codify even that behavior. But, if, but even then, I mean, if, help, if you judge that your human is about to go die uh, and they've made up, would you not do your best to convince them not to do it? And 
then But that's the one, question right this is great yeah do irrational decisions define humanity there are there we always we have, all of us have been in situations where the logical thing to do is x but there's something which drives us to do y right we take a whimsical yeah. decision we take an illogical choice which is like this doesn't make sense but i something tells me i want to do it so i'm going to do it exactly yeah so does irrationality define humanity is that something that's the purview of just humans or is that something that is ai able to overcome fundamental logical programming and do irrational things right so is it you saying if once ai starts to make decisions based on emotion it has finally achieved true humanity has it i'm not saying i'm asking has it I- I don't know could I, this this could very well be the case and this is why I love this film because I I don't know the answer to it and this is this is like a there there are some days I gravitate towards the theory that oh the whole thing was a sham that it was like I think companies understood what uh the understood the loneliness of men and basically created this AI model that would that would counteract every, every feeling that they were going through and it's happening right now if you think about it if you think about it if you the men messaging women on webcams and on only fans and asking for um uh, asking for some sort of validation where the women say oh you're you're great you're this you're that it's there's there's an epidemic of it at at this point in time so i can truly see corporations leaning into it and and doubling down so again you asked me on a day like what 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 my theory is on joy if she was if she really did become a bit human at the end and it could be one of two things no i agree i, I don't think we're going to have a satisfactory resolution to any of these themes uh, which is great yeah, yeah but is... i think we've left all of them on, uh, at great questions yes so that that, much that like uh, yeah much like the film that uh, brings us to the last and the most outlandish section of uh, our pod uh kudos to abin he's come up with a, a, a right doozy for today uh, our last section is what if x were to do y which uh, for those of you who are new to uh, this format or those of you who haven't heard last episode Essentially what we do in this last section of the pod is uh, play out if a certain other director were to direct the movie that we're discussing. So for today's uh, version we have uh, Abhin's going to take you through the synopsis and then we'll just flesh out some of the actors. We'll we'll do a bit of discussion there but today we're going to discuss what if Sanjay Leela Bhansali <laughs> were to direct the Blade Runner movie movies. So how would that play out right. what's the plot like? This is Blade Runner Symphony of Souls <laughs> directed <laughs> directed by Sanjay Leela Bansali So in a future where replicants are integrated into society officer K is tasked with tracking down replicants who have deviated from their designated roles His journey leads him to Nana a replicant with unique K ability to Nana <laughs> a replicant with unique ability to compose and manipulate emotions through music Nana's ethereal performances captivate audiences evoking emotions that mirror What the audiences of the We're in a dispo- dystopia <laughs> street audiences as Kate delves into Nana's enigmatic world he discovers a powerful connection between her music and the lost art of human emotions their lost parts art. intertwine blurring the lines between human and replicant Kate's pursuit of Nana brings him into contact with the influential and reclusive master Ray, Mr Ray a genius composer who harbors a dark secret as Kate and as Bond deepens they find themselves entangled in a conspiracy that challenges the very foundations of their existence their journey leads them to confront the imposing Tygoon Wallace who seeks to harness Nana's unique ability for their own gain the film's climax crescendos into a dramatic confrontation and a breathtaking masquerade ball where past and future collide and the characters <laughs> are irrevocably altered So who are we casting as 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 the wooden? Oh yeah. Man? So who are we casting? Hey, uh, yeah, actually Ryan Gosling was fair. Oh yeah, you need peop- uh, somebody who can act robotic. Then I think uh, Salman Khan fits the bill. He can't act. For Salman shit Khan is <laughs> exactly Salman Khan is K. <laughs> who is Nana? Who, who's who's uh, who's Nana? Nana could be Deepika Padukone. Okay, because we cast her and everything, she'll figure it out. um yeah i mean that's his companion that's right you can put her anywhere yeah. that's true 
it's the easiest answer you can put Deepika Padukone in this film and she'll carry it and it's oh, a Sanjana Bansali movie is there a joy in this film because isn't nena his love interest dancer nena in this dystopian dancer nena <laughs> yeah or oh, dancer nena then we need to cast k as uh, ranbir kapoor basically this is ye jawani deewani in blade runner you know <laughs> i'm i'm trying to think of pun names of age fuck it uh, uh, let's let's move mm-hmm. on okay so then ranbir kapoor is uh, k and deepika yes. padukone is nena oh damn okay, okay. Hmm. uh who's who's what mr roy yeah maestro roy the 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 brooding figure the he's her master yeah basically this, i assume he's like a phantom of the opera character is what i would think oh okay so he's Dandi like the Pula. replicant but phantom yeah fair i don't know why when, when, be... whenever my mind goes to like uh, brooding bollywood actors it's like randeep hooda we have written ridley scott is looking for us <laughs> where are these guys i want to come kill them both okay no you, you also said you had certain changes to make to this plot or add what what did you have in mind oh no 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 i mean again none of those things can be said on the podcast <laughs> So basically what changes is, is like okay let's talk about this film. So what really changes in this movie of you have Ranbir Kapoor as, as So as see if it's a Sanjay Leela Bansali yeah. right this is this is yeah. not a, a nuanced take on the definition of humanity. Humans and Far androids are two warring feuds they've been warring for generations right. This is like yes. Ramleela. So K is representing replicants and uh, Nena is this human dystopian dancer. <laughs> yeah. their falling in love now means they have to overcome the prejudice that humans and replicants fuck what prejudice replicants even have against humans they own you bitch but anyways but okay fine no, whatever <laughs> this this world replicants are prejudice okay let's 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 take that into yeah. and now basically the challenge is that k and and nena have to come up with a dance performance that is so electrifying that people have to forget their differences and like dance together that's the and that that final dance off or the group dance happens at this masquerade ball that this movie supposedly has in its yes. climax yes and then at the end of the masquerade ball they die i keep again true traditions of sanjeela bansali films they both have to die because yeah. sanjeela bansali loves tragedies so they die and their death ultimately leads to the the mixing of the humans and replicant societies hum cell de chuke sanam i'm trying to think of yes, more that 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 that's it <laughs> okay that, that's it <laughs> <laughs> that, that that's the movie hum cell de chuke is out done okay yeah i don't know they run on batteries um, but yeah we can make it work hum cell de chuke in, in interlinked interlinked cells so it's that's fine yeah. i get it fair enough yeah we that's the movie we found the stretch call us the movie and that's the ep- <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's the movie that's the episode what a way to end we went from like such an interesting fun conversation on the themes of this films and and the world to um this i'm sorry they took us in i'm sorry they took us in nobody has done an slb version of it for good yeah, reason it's a yeah okay slb's um, blade runner do do androids dream of uh, electric gangra uh, gungri <laughs> <laughs> oh my god but yeah anyway that's the episode that's the episode we'll see you next week <laughs>